Um, I don't think Sharon's actually my boss till the beginning of, till the end of the week, are you, Sharon? She's, she's finishing the AIDS conference first, but it's, it's wonderful that she is coming. The, uh, the artist's impression is our new institute. It's actually a real building now and it's full of people and all we're waiting for is in fact Sharon. Um, after Tony Fauci, there's really not much left to say. I don't know anyone who can get as much material into 20 minutes as Tony and do it with such, such precision and accuracy. I, I actually don't work on AIDS. I've tried a few times, but it's in the category of what we describe as TBH, too bloody hard. And my main role in, in, with regard to AIDS has been, to, as a senior scientist who works on other things, to um, chair uh, review committees and chair a few scientific advisory committees, including Bart Haynes Charvey for a while, which was a great experience. I must say, this research community is the most dedicated, uh, decent, and, and very intelligent that one will meet anywhere. It is a fantastic group of people tackling an enormously difficult problem. And, and of course, we do regret that loss that we've suffered recently on that, uh, that terrible airline disaster. Now, I'm going to tell you about cytotoxic T cells or killer T cells. Um, Tony mentioned them, he pretty much covered it in fact, but I'll tell you a bit about what we've learned from influenza and I'll show you a couple of videos if they work just for some light relief. Um, influenza viruses are different from HIV in the sense that they're incredibly infectious and, and uh, people don't feel sick when they first catch them and they're coughing up a lot of, or sneezing a lot of flu virus right early on, and that's the way flu travels. It actually flies. It's basically a bird virus. They're basically viruses that are maintained in nature in aquatic birds in enormous diversity and occasionally jump across to us, maybe via chickens or pigs or whatever. Uh, but it flies in aeroplanes because infected people fly from city to city and they transmit it very regularly. The 19, uh, the 2000, uh, and uh, when, when was it? The 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic, we probably had the virus in Melbourne before it was first detected in Mexico. And that's how fast these things go. They'll go across the United States in a month to six weeks. Um, similarities, they both viruses, HIV and flu viruses, have very poor proofreading mechanisms and they throw off mutants all the time. Um, the flu viruses, unlike HIV, are not systemic. They're, at least not normally. They're, they're localised infections in the respiratory tract and that's where we have to worry about them. And of course, the great difference between flu and HIV, apart from the fact that influenza is so much more infectious, is that flu does not have a reverse transcriptase. It does not come back into the genome. We do not have a persistence problem with influenza. Though the viruses can persist surprisingly long. We've had cases of them pers persisting for 12, 18 months in highly immunosuppressed individuals who've been immunosuppressed for cancer. And it's interesting that those highly immunosuppressed individuals are throwing off mutants all the time. And they may be a bigger source of mutants mutations than we actually think. Um, flu pandemics run for one to three years. Then you get what's called seasonal epidemics. These are simply uh, mutated variants of the hemagglutinin, which then allow a new variant of an existing flu strain to circulate. We, we retain the term pandemic for viruses that come across from wildlife, domestic species, and so forth. Strategy of flu for survival is not persistence within the individual. It's growing in enormous numbers of species, particularly the aquatic birds. And of course, it infects everything from whales to sea lions to seals to, to tigers, anything at all. It's a, a very much a, a, a ubiquitous type of pathogen. Immunity. Um, Immunity comes from the word uh, immunus, which means without tax. It actually refers to uh, soldiers in the Roman Empire who, after they returned from the war, for, were, were members of what's called the genio immunium, at least under some Roman administrations, and they are exempt from tax. This is something that really, and the tax we're talking about with immunity, is it's evolved to deal with the tax of infection. And it's a very complex system with many different components. We have the innate components that are turned on immediately and uh, are being studied more in HIV than they were in the past. They can never actually stop the infection, but they can hold it in check for a while until the specific or adaptive immune system gets underway. 
Of course, we have to worry about a world without tax totally, because our type of research really depends on someone paying some tax and getting our research funded. And uh, we worry about, um, well, our present government from that point of view, and also the, the US uh, GOP. But still, we hope that somebody pays some tax. So the CD8 killer T cell is actually the legionnaire of the immune system. The antibodies act essentially by grabbing hold of the virus. The virus is tiny, they bind to the outside of the virus, and it's only what's on the outside of the virus that we think is important. That may not be the whole story, because other virus components do get put on the surface of infected cells, and there are other mechanisms that are actually not measured by standing, standard neutralizing antibodies, like antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, that could be operating to give you a better result than you think you're getting with a virus that's not necessarily neutralizing in a standard assay. The killer T cell is not about attacking the virus as a virus particle. It's about attacking the virus infected cell. All viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens. They have to grow within cells. And the job of the killer T cell is to get rid of that virus factory. It would be a terrible waste if the T cell was focused onto a virus particle, because there are billions of these things. It needs to be focused onto those virus infected cells. Now, that imposes certain limitations, of course, including the question of accessibility, getting the T cell into the right site, because you have to get a big cell in there. Now, here's a T cell working. The green thing is the T cell. The the other cell is the virus infected cell. When it turns pink, its membrane is breached, and you can see it is definitely killed. These things are killers. They're actually not killers in the sense of murderers. They're inducers of suicide cells, because what they do is activate the cell's suicide pathway in the target cell they're trying to destroy. But you can see they're, they're not just inducers of suicide, they're, they're actually also necrophiliac, because that T cell's hanging around there. The, these were... Uh, <laughs> This was work done by Misty Jenkins, who's uh, a Koori scholar. She's part uh, Indigenous Australian. And, uh, and of course, the way the, T the, the movies were made by Misty, the way the T cell focuses onto a uh, cell surface is that it focuses onto a peptide from the virus, and Gus mentioned it can see internal components of the virus, and that's how it does it. Because what happens is the transplantation proteins, the HLA molecules that you will hear about in the meeting from time to time, carry these virus peptides, eight to 10 amino acids, 12 amino acids, to the cell surface. And this is what, this is actually a peptide bound into the tip of one of those transplant molecules. The transplant molecules themselves are very polymorphic, very, very variable. And some of them will pick up these things and some won't, and I'll say a little bit about that. But this is the bit of the virus that the T cell is seeing while also interfacing with this. One of the great things about uh, this stuff for me is that I've been in the science a long time. When we found this HLA restriction, as it was called, early, early on, we were thinking about cells and T cells like ping pong balls interacting. I mean, it was very, very naive thinking. Now we actually are thinking about molecular events interfacing protein, in protein-protein interactions, and we're guided by the chemistry. And that's the wonderful thing that's happened in science over the years. And one of the things that's kept many of us in it is this enormous advance in molecular science that has enabled us to do so many more things. Now, all immune responses require clonal expansion and differentiation. You've got a relatively few precursor cells. Uh, Tony talked about the very, very rare precursor B cells that have these cross-reactive antibodies. But they are the big hope at the moment, and we certainly hope this works out. And I'm particularly interested, for instance, in David Baltimore's type of approach of transfecting these genes in to make those antibodies. Though how that would work on a, on a very big scale, I don't know, but I think it's very promising. They're very rare, and there is a problem of autoimmunity. But both with T cells and B cells, it's the same story. You get multiplication, they replicate very quickly, you get to large numbers very quickly. Of course, if you don't stop that in some way, you, you'll end up with leukemia if some uh, control mechanism goes wrong. Uh, you get effector cells, these are the killer T cells, the antibody producing cells, and you get uh, memory cells. After you've been infected with something like influenza, you get an increased number of cells that can respond. Some very specifically to the inducing 
transmitting virus, and, and if it's like influenza, some that are cross-reactive because of these internal peptides, which are much more shared between different viruses and are not under quite as severe and selective pressure. So it's immunological memory, of course, that we're inducing as we prime with a vaccine. These memory cells, the plasma cells that are producing the antibodies, the cross-reactive antibodies, in, in uh, HIV, we'll sit around in lymphoid tissue, they'll sit around in bone marrow, they'll pump stuff out for life, and we'll also have the memory B cells that give rise to them circulating in the blood and localising too in various places. It's an enormously complex and very intriguing system. Uh, one of the reasons that immunology over the years has been sometimes a rather confused subject, much less confused now than it used to be, is that it's so, so complex. And we've got cells in different compartments moving around the body, local localizing in different places. It's really quite hard to even count how many immune cells there are in, uh, in, in a particular situation. But that's part of the fascination, of course. This is a, an illustration of, of, uh, of, of an a initial immune response that cells clonally expand. We get our cytotoxic T cells or whatever. Many of the cells die off. Then we get long-term memory, which will last for the life with a CD8 T cell response, will last for the life of a lab mouse. It will last for up to 50 years in humans the, the number will fall off. And then if you get reinfected again and there's a cross-reactive virus or whatever, you get clonal expansion again, you get a secondary response, which is much, much bigger. And that, of course, is what you're trying to achieve. We've also found that, as with anything else, our capacity to respond to a new pathogen falls off with age. We lose our precursor cells, the naive cells that Tony mentioned. Uh, we've found recently, at least in mice, and we're now looking at it in humans, that if you prime very early, that is, if you vaccinate in childhood or prime a mouse when it's young, you will retain the full repertoire of memory cells, the full spectrum. If you don't do that, you will lose cells as you get older. But if you prime early, you will retain the full repertoire. So any priming strategy is best started off in childhood, perhaps with boosting through life, for whatever pathogen you're actually thinking about. Um, here's some more. These are actually what we call resting memory T cells. You can see they're not really resting, are they? They're, they're jigging about. These are in the skin of a mouse infected with a herpes virus. And these are constantly monitoring cells, looking for changes and looking for, for something that they will then respond to and, and, re, and, and differentiate to be killers again. Now, we, we conceive that those T cell populations are sitting in tissues all over the body, kind of ready to go. We've got some circulating in the blood, some of these memory cells, some sitting in tissues as these so-called resting resident memory T cells. And uh, again, where, how important it is to have those in the right site is a good question. Maybe very important, say, with human papillomavirus infection, to have them in the, the vaginal epithelium and so forth. No. Now, just an influenza experiment. Influenza viruses really only grow on the respiratory tract. We infect with virus, grows in the respiratory tract. Response goes on in the regional lymph nodes here. Here's what a primary and a secondary response looks like. This is actually um, a primary response. These are numbers of T cells we can watch out of the lung, and that's the secondary response. And you can see it's massive compared with the primary response. These are bronchoalveolar lavage cells. That, that what happens, though, is the virus is only eliminated a day or two earlier. And so the problem is that T cells have to be turned back on. And they have to be turned back on probably, some, in the, some locally, but mostly in the lymphoid tissue. And there was a lot of work done on trying to develop T cell based vaccines. Uh, Norm Letvin had very promising in, early results in primates, for instance. But in the end, it's not enough to do it. And the reason for that is, as Tony says, it takes a very, very short time for HIV to get in, to get established in latency uh, or, or in, 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 in uh, uh, persistent form, and, and, uh, and then you, you can't get rid of it. So T T cells can never do that job. They could never give you sterilizing immunity. They may be useful in an uh, add-on, but the only thing that will ever give you sterilizing immunity that we know of is some sort of antibody neutralization type effect. Um, here again, we see our killer T cells, they're, and you can see that they're serial killers as well as being neutrophiliac. And um, this is work, Catherine Kaczewska, who's taken on uh, 
working with humans in our flu system, we've been mouse, a mouse lab up until fairly recently, collaborated extensively with a group in Shanghai when we got this H7N9 influenza event. You know about H5N1, the terrible bird flu that never actually jumped to cause a dreadful pandemic, though, though we, we worried about it at the time, and we are still concerned. H7N9 is another virus that's just come out of nature. A bird virus infected a lot of people, but there was no transmission between people. And this is what happened with H5N1 too. There was very, a terrible disease when it infected people, but there was not much transmission between them. But this is being watched very, very closely. About 33% of the people who were infected with that died. It was mostly older males, because older men are pretty useless, as everyone knows. And one of the things that the wives do with them to get them out of the house in China, and they tend to be fairly small accommodations, is send them off to the live bird market, because Chinese like to buy live birds. And they go along there, and they chat, and they get infected with flu, and they die. And so... Um, <laughs> And in general, uh, influenza is, is a much worse disease as we get older. And our vaccines, though we advise everyone to get vaccinated, uh, particularly older people, our vaccines don't work nearly as well as they should. And, we, and we've got a lot of challenges with flu vaccines too, uh, it, even though it's not nearly as complex a disease to handle as, 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 as HIV. And the normal flu vaccine actually works pretty well, though you have to keep remaking it for all the variants that come along. Now, there's a conservation of peptides. We call them epitopes, but we're talking about those peptides that bind to the MHC, and will be presented by different MHC or HLA molecules. And you can see this is a story for H7N9. This is just going through, looking at the sequences and, and working out how many conserved ones they have. And we have them. These are two of the main internal proteins, the nuclear protein and the matrix one. And you can see there's quite a spectrum of them. Uh, the question is, though, uh, how well will they be presented and how much are we likely to have memory cells against them in various populations? If we've got an HLA-A2, which is what many of us are, uh, many Caucasians have HLA-A2 quite prominently, and, uh, and Indians and so, uh, people from the subcontinent of India and so forth, uh, then we have a lot of this cross-reactive T-cell memory. And I'll show you, that looks as though it's a quite considerable benefit. If, on the other hand, we have... HLA-A2402 or B702, we don't have much of this cross-reactive T-cell memory to flu. Now, why is that interesting? The reason it's interesting is, if you look at this, these are the uh, populations that have a lot of cross-reactive immunity. And here's the numbers down below. If you look at it, you'll see that our Australian indigenous population and our, the Alaskan Yupik uh, have actually, because they have quite a lot of A2402, have very relatively low numbers of cross-reactive T cells that can respond. And the, that correlates with the fact that influenza is very bad in these two populations. Australian Aboriginals were terribly affected by the 1919 flu. The 1918 flu got here in 1919. It took a long while because it came by ship. There was no international air travel. So by the time it got here, it was relatively milder. But it was really bad in the indigenous population. And it was really bad in indigenous Alaskans. And this could be one reason for it. They have less of that cross-reactive T-cell T -cell memory that can provide a measure of protection. And this is just showing you what happened in those, those H7 and 9 patients. The group in Shanghai is a fantastic clinical group. And they really took wonderful samples from the very earliest time, stored them. And we've been able to go back, or Catherine has been able to go back, and look at those in great detail. And you can see the ones that are recovered made a very fast CD8 T cell response, not much of a CD4 T cell response. And that, to our mind, reflects, though we didn't see them before infection, these are cases that have been admitted to hospital, that, to, my, to our mind, reflects they had pretty good T cell memory that kicked off very fast. Those that took a bit longer to recover, not quite as many CD8 T cells, uh, but the CD4 T cells were coming up a lot. And we've seen this in various types of experimental models. If you don't get that initial clearance from the CD8 T cells, and you don't get it by antibody, if you, get, if you had the, exactly the right antibody there, you wouldn't see any of this at all. You see no infection and you see the thing stopped. But if you don't have much CD8 T cell memory, then you, get a, you may get a smaller CD8 response, but it gives time to really push that CD4 response along so we have more CD4 T cells. So these people recovered more slowly. 
These recovered more slowly again, but they did recover. And you can see uh, there's actually a lot of NK cells here, the, uh, the innate response element. Not prominent here at all, because the CD8s are probably doing the job, more here and more there. Then, of course, you get the guys that actually died, and uh, they're not doing much at all. Now, there, there could be various factors in that. Very severe influenza virus infections are actually extremely immunosuppressive. It's probably due to the cytokine, chemokine uh, response profiles, as well as the lack of any pre-existing immunity. Uh, we worry also in, in acute influenza about cytokine shock, but that's a whole different story, and it really has no parallel in HIV as far as I know. Anyway, so that's the story. Uh, there is evidence from clinical studies uh, and from uh, field studies that virus-specific CD8 T cell memory can give you a measure of protection in flu. Whether we would ever actually talk vaccine manufacturers and regulatory authorities into developing that sort of vaccine that would give you this cross-reactive immunity is a moot point. I don't know whether they do it. It would not be fully protective, but it would make the disease much less severe, and it would be there as a potential vaccine in case of a rapidly spreading and quite novel pandemic, because these things are completely new when they come in. Uh, with respect to, um, to, of course, CTLs, the CD8 T cells, do a fantastic job in HIV until the whole system is undermined, though they can't give you sterilizing immunity. Uh, it's, it's, as Tony mentioned, a moot point whether you might not, even if you can get that cross-reactive antibody thing to work, whether it might not be useful to actually have a belt and braces approach and also have your CD8 T cells primed up. A long way to go with this. Thank you very much.